Let's get some questions from the audience. Um, what I'd love, I'm sure we have microphones around. I see some hands, but I can't really see faces. So there's a gentleman with his hand up in the second row. Um, is there a microphone? Keep, keep going the second row, le deuxième, là. And then there's someone in like, looks like a yellow sweater. Okay. Okay, please. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Leishoubi, j'ai déjà intervenu. Ah oui. Je me suis présenté. Euh, le, le, je, je voudrais poser une question qui me semble essentielle. Cela a été esquissé, mais est-ce qu'on ne devrait pas se préoccuper du fait que Trump est aussi euh, le produit de l'échec des approches précédentes Et donc, euh, il, il joue ce rôle de, de, de rupture. À partir de là, est-ce que l'analyse sur ces échecs et ces approches ne devrait pas être plus approfondie Première question, j'aimerais que mes amis panélistes y reviennent. Et, et est-ce que, au delà de Trump, quelles seraient les évolutions Parce qu'il est en échec par rapport aux approches précédentes. Les approches précédentes sont dénoncées, sont inefficaces. J'aimerais un œil, j'aimerais une analyse sur cette question. Et comment imagine-t-on les nouvelles évolutions à la lumière de cette contradiction Merci. OK, merci. Merci, monsieur. Euh, ouais. Oui, euh, Hervé Mariton. Euh, D'abord, en tant qu'Algérois, pour approuver la question de notre ami algérien, qui, sur le premier point, me paraît très importante, euh, les échecs qui ont conduit à Trump. But I would put two quick points. First, uh, how is it that uh, Trump still has a very large popular support Are there that many idiots in the States? Or is it that Trump bashing, as we've heard from part of the panel this morning, has exactly the reverse effect? Second point, uh, Trump has probably uh, the uh, useful policy, and that was uh, part of the final analysis from our moderator, to uh, exert and try and exert some influence uh, towards and in a way against Chinese expansionism today, from its near vicinity, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and extended to Africa, indeed here in Morocco, and many countries in the, on the planet. So if Trump does not do that, who else? And in a way, a question maybe to Mr. Vedrine and others on the panel, uh, would it be imaginable that other parties on the planet if not Trump, somebody else, some other country, takes that sort of responsibility, or is the world totally to the idea that there's one type of expansionism that has no answer, no reaction, and maybe a final conclusion, we may express many criticisms okay. towards, towards, towards Trump, it's not my cup of tea, but on freedom of speech, human rights, I'd still rather live in the States than in China. Okay, very good. Um, could you pass the microphone behind you to your right? Could, um, and, and then, are, are there any questions over on this side? I can't see. Okay, anyway, please. And, 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 um, and, and if I could just ask you, I should have done before, just please identify yourself. Would you mind terribly? Yes. Everyone? Riyad <laughs> Abed Euh, ma question, est-ce que <coughs> l'unilatéralisme américain et la guerre commerciale menée euh, n'affaiblit pas le dollar comme euh, monnaie d'échange euh, dans le commerce international Merci. Ok, merci, monsieur. Let's take a couple more. This right down in front. He... Madame, voilà. Okay. And then um, there's a gentleman right. on the aisle there. Thank Can you. I go ahead? Please. Okay, I'm Jean-Pierre Cavesson from Hong Kong Baptist University. Just, uh, um, all right, yes. Um, general remark, it looks like Europeans believe more in Trump's words and less in, its, in his actions than the, the Asians. It looks like the Asians are more cautious and more concentrated in the actions of the Trump administration beyond the words it has 
uttered. So that's a general remark. Now, I have a specific question to Wang Ti Su or anyone um, who is um, based in the Asia Pacific region, is regarding the uh, US um, China confrontation. Now, in, in China, in the last few years, there was a there were a lot of debates about the U.S. decline. It looks like today this debate has been forgotten uh, because maybe the U.S. Uh, has um, uh, come back uh, to Asia. And the Trump administration in many ways has developed some kind of uh, super rebalancing policy towards, a, uh, towards, uh, towards China. And I'm happy that uh, Hubert Verdin mentioned the South China Sea because I would like to have uh, Wang Tisu's view and other Asian representatives on the panel on the um, risks of crisis in the South China Sea or in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, I think Taiwan was just mentioned very briefly, but that's another hot spot we should uh, look at. Now the question is uh, whether there is a chance for such a, a crisis. And, um, the other issue is whether the Cold War, the, 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 the trade war between China and the US, uh, as you sort of alluded to, is, uh, is going to uh, put enough pressure on the Chinese leadership to reform. And okay. I would like to have your own view on that. Great. It seems to me that it's uh, unlikely, but maybe you have another view. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. And Jawad Kartouti, je suis président de l'Institut marocain des relations internationales. Et j'ai deux questions pour Monsieur Védrine. Euh, j'ai remarqué euh, que on a beaucoup parlé de l'Asie, on a beaucoup parlé de l'Europe, mais on n'a absolument pas parlé de l'Afrique. Alors ma, ma question à Monsieur Védrine est-ce que euh, Trump a une politique africaine ou bien est-ce que ça l'intéresse absolument pas Ça c'est ma première question. Euh, la deuxième, c'est concernant le conflit euh, israélo-palestinien. Euh, Trump est allé au-delà de tous les présidents précédents en reconnaissant Jérusalem comme capitale euh, d'Israël, euh, en annulant toutes les aides qui étaient données par les États-Unis aux, aux Palestiniens et même en annulant la représentation palestinienne à Washington. Ouais. On parle d'un plan Trump pour le conflit israélo-palestinien. Et ma question à M. Védrine, est-ce que ce plan existe-t-il réellement et quels seraient ses contours Merci. Merci, monsieur. OK, let's, let's, go, let's come back here. Let's try to first answer the questions about Asia Pacific and um, worries about the South China Sea. Mr. Wang, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, first, I'm in very much in agreement with my, Michael's point that the United States is changing, but not changing totally. I think some people say Trump is some kind of aberration in world politics, in US politics. I don't totally agree, but I think, I think he represents, as I said earlier, the divisiveness in world politics. And uh, the divisiveness is caused by increased uh, economic inequality among many countries, and also the identity politics that is exacerbated by the economic inequality. So if we come to US-China relations, I think uh, the relationship is influenced by their domestic politics. Uh, in the United States, uh, the criticisms of China are rising up, not only in, in the Trump administration, but in the political uh, community as a whole. So I don't think this is a short-term phenomenon because Trump is surrounded by people who, are, who have hostile or uh, strong reservations about China. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the South China Sea and the Taiwan uh, question, the two sides do not want to fight a war over these islands or over Taiwan. But the tensions are rising up uh, because people in China hold 
nationalistic feelings, sentiments about the United States. And people in the United States are saying China is uh, trying to replace the United States uh, domination uh, in East Asia. Uh, but I think in, in the practical terms, uh, the two sides are very cautious mm -hmm. not to be engaged in uh, an actual military conflict. The two, two, uh, two militaries are talking to each other, and I think they will be somewhat reserved in uh, making a, uh, uh, some skirmishes. Uh, so I am moderately optimistic about the South China Sea and Taiwan, okay. but, uh, I mean, regardless of the rhetoric. Can I ask you, though, maybe a slightly difficult question. I mean, China has joined much of the world order and has asked everyone to obey the rules. And, and, and yet, the decision of the court about these islands has been totally ignored by China. And I wonder how that fits with the Chinese view that everyone should obey the rules except themselves. I think China says that it, it, it abides by international law and it is a, a, a contributor to uh, the current world order. Uh, of course, their, their behavior uh, has uh, generated some concerns over the South China Sea and elsewhere. But I think uh, the preoccupation of China today is still domestic uh, yes. economy. So I don't think China will be engaged in any adventurous uh, things abroad. Uh, going back to uh, the question about China's reform, I think uh, it is expected that China, the Communist Party will hold another plenum uh, after the party congress and I, I hope these people have some expectations about economic reform. But I think economic reform may be uh, restored but I think the political situation may remain uh, unchanged. Uh, okay. There's still a, a great deal of effort to consolidate uh, the power base of the Communist Party. Yes, 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 precisely. Mr. Fujisaki and then, and then uh, Michael. Very shortly, uh, our relations with China are improving, so I have to be rather cautious. But my personal view, uh, I have two concerns. One, about uh, South China Sea and other issues. Fait accompli, or you do things first and then extending smiling hands afterwards. I think that's a little concern to us. Second is uh, idea like AIIB or OBOR, One Belt, One Road, which we will discuss later. Great ideas, maybe, but it, does, it doesn't come this way that, hey, I have a good idea, let's discuss to make it it comes like, I have a good idea. Those who want to join, come on the board. I think these are the two small concerns I have on China's diplomacy. Okay, Michael, let's, let's, I mean, not, this is not aimed at you, but let's try to keep our responses short so we have time to go to the audience one more time, please. Can I respond to the, the gentleman in the yellow, in the yellow sweater, uh, who made the argument that Mr. Trump is confronting an expansionist China I don't really see it that way. I don't recognise that in Mr Trump's policies. The truth is he's been very inconsistent on China. During the campaign he was very tough. During the first 18 months in office he coddled China. He didn't confront China. You remember the Mar-a-Lago summit, the, all the, 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 the early love affair with um, Xi Jinping. Now US policy on China has toughened up for sure. The Pence speech, very tough reminiscent of a sort of Cold War rollback approach to China. Why has that changed? I think trade is Mr Trump's red line and I think he's angry about that. Secondly, he's pushing on an open door. The truth is that everybody in Washington has toughened on China. Democrats and Republicans are getting sick of Chinese foreign policy and there's a, it's very easy for Mr Trump to make this argument. And also, I think there's a sort of, there's a distraction element. While he's being attacked on Russia, he can give a big speech on China and say, look over there, there's nothing happening here. Look over at China. Uh, I think Mr. Trump will be tough, will con be continued to be tough on China's um, economic approach. But it's not clear to me to come to the South China Sea issue 
that he's going to take risks on really hard security issues because he hasn't done that to date and he doesn't care really about alliance guarantees. The idea that Donald Trump is going to uh, take big risks on the grounds of half-submerged water features in a waterway on the other side of the world seems very unlikely to me. The second point, just very quickly, Stephen, you also made the point, sir, about Trump bashing. And I think that's a fair point. I think Mr Trump has had successes in his foreign policy. The two points I would make is, first of all, the, the scale of the successes are not what he says they are, and he doesn't care too much about the scale of the successes. So we have to be very careful in interrogating what those successes are. Mm -hmm. The second question I'd put to you, at what price do these successes come? Yes, the stronger party in a negotiation can always wring um, concessions out of the weaker party, but in the long term that will tend to undercut your reliability, your reputation and your prestige. And the genius of the US-led order after the Second World War was what the great American historian John Lewis Gaddis described as hegemony by consent. America achieved hegemony over much of the world by consent. The world consented in America's hegemony. But if you, if, you keep, if you misuse your power, if you're too strong, if you take every advantage you have, then that consent okay. will go away. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> That's great. Um, Mr. Roy, did you want to speak? And, I just want to say that. And, the, and then we'll go to Mr. When uh, Kim Jong-un was shooting those missiles, China, instead of trying to calm down the North Koreans, they punished South Korea when we put that anti-missile system. So how can you, you know, and it's for our own protection, it's a defense mechanism. So for China to punish, penalize South Korea for putting this system to defend ourselves. And Korea, we've been bullied um, uh, by the Chinese for 5,000 years. So it's, it's, it's in the DNA of the Chinese to uh, bully you uh, and threaten you. So I'd rather have some kind of a U.S. presence for, for, uh, for trying to uh, prevent some kind of adventurism from China. It's my personal opinion. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vidrin, there are a number of questions addressed to you, so, s'il vous plaît. Uh, oui, Steven, je réponds très vite à la, aux, aux deux questions de notre ami marocain, et j'ai une remarque globale pour terminer. Sur l'Afrique, Trump n'a pas de politique africaine globale, mais d'ailleurs personne n'a de politique africaine globale. Il peut avoir des politiques en Afrique, sur tel ou tel point particulier, qui peut l'intéresser. Ce n'était pas le cas pour le moment et ce n'était pas majeur dans l'échange que nous avions. Deuxièmement, le plan sur Israël-Palestine, c'est un plan bantoustan, du tout. Il constate que le Likoud a gagné, en gros, que les pays arabes de la région ont d'autres soucis, que plus personne ne soutient la, euh, la politique à deux États, sauf les Européens, et notamment la France, avec un certain courage verbal. Mais voilà, donc ils vont, ils vont abuser de cette situation pour dire c'est à prendre ou à laisser, à mon avis. Sur, globalement, ce que je voulais dire, c'est que les Occidentaux ne retrouveront pas la maîtrise globale du système mondial. Il n'y a d'ailleurs pas de système mondial, il y a ce que Guterres appelle le, le chaos. Bon. Les Occidentaux n'y arriveront pas, les États-Unis n'y arriveront pas, même avec la brutalité de Trump. Les Occidentaux, en plus, ne sont pas d'accord entre eux sur ces questions. Je pense que la Chine n'y arrivera pas non plus. Je ne pense pas que ce soit d'ailleurs le projet de la Chine, et même si c'était son projet... Euh, euh, nouveau, elle n'y arriverait pas parce qu'il y aura des systèmes quand même d'indigment par rapport à la Chine, confus, mais malgré tout. Les émergents, en général, n'ont pas d'unité entre eux. Regardez Inde, Chine, par exemple. Donc, on est dans un système de chaotique assez dur. Chaotique, ça ne veut pas dire la guerre, mais chaotique, durable, instable. Ce qui fait qu'à mon avis, il y a un rendez-vous devant nous entre les puissances installées depuis deux ou trois siècles qui sont quand même relativement sur la défensive, et les puissances montantes, qui sont montantes dans le désordre. Il y a un rendez-vous. Soit ça aura lieu à travers des, des dizaines de batailles dangereuses et pénibles sur tous les terrains, politiques, monétaires, militaires, etc., soit à un moment donné, s'organisera une sorte de discussion générale qui n'a pas eu lieu après la fin de l'Union soviétique, qui avait eu lieu après la fin de la Première Guerre mondiale, pas très bien, après la fin de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, plutôt bien, et qui n'a pas eu lieu. Donc ma seule idée simple, c'est que ce rendez-vous n'est pas derrière nous. Il ne s'agit pas simplement de faire en sorte que 
les pires récalcitrants ou contestataires s'intègrent au système qui a déjà été organisé et qui est magnifique, je pense que le rendez-vous est devant nous. Et ça pose des questions très, très, très compliquées aux puissances qui étaient les puissances dominantes d'avant. C'est plus compliqué que pour les autres, donc pour les Européens. Merci. Um, Igor, I don't want to put you on the spot, but one of the things M. Vitrine just said, which is always intriguing me, is we have traditional powers, we have rising powers. There's clearly a change. There's a co Where does Russia see itself in this? I mean, does it see itself part of the future or hanging on to the past? Uh, <clears throat> By the course of events, uh, our politics were reactive because we do not represent uh, the power and potential economic and military one of the Soviet Union, but we still thought of ourselves as the adversary of the United States and in this bipolar competition. The Ukrainian crisis, Syrian crisis were the reaction to this. At the moment, it's obvious that we cannot take this burden upon ourselves uh, alone. But through dual containment of the United States, of China and of Russia, we are organizing counter dual containment of the United States. So we can be allies of China at the moment. Uh, hypothetically, if something goes very well uh, beyond Putin, then we can go back to the Western world. But at the moment, uh, until 2024 at least, I don't think it will happen. You know, I mean, in a way, some people maybe it's a joke, but they suggest that Putin is doing to the United States what Nixon did to the Soviet Union by moving toward China. Something like that, yes. and uh, he's a very good player in this, and tactically, I think that we made a lot of successes. We're back in the Middle East, and we can uh, bargain uh, uh, our Palestinian dash Arab dash Turkish dash Iranian connections, uh, on, and we can we can be a player, and we can pretend to go back on the top table. Mm -hmm. But the weakness is a, is a economy, demography, and other things. And in the long run, we cannot play this role anymore. Okay, thanks. Um, we have eight minutes, so I'd like to take a couple more questions. I don't know if Jim Lowenstein's out there. If he is. We had talked about a question. So if Jim, you're out there somewhere, stand up. Um, where? OK. OK, could you give him a microphone, please? Thank you, Jeff. Jim, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm a retired American diplomat. So of course, what I worry about is the image of the United States. Uh, to what degree do you think uh, Europeans and Asians separate their reaction to President Trump from their uh, opinion uh, on the United States? Thank you. A uh, couple more. I mean, in the front, is it Carrie? I can't see. There's a woman in the front row, please. As someone who has a foot on either side of the Atlantic, I wonder if we might not also look at Trump as someone who puts his finger on the divisions, as Rosalind was, uh, was referring to, of the, the losers in the, in the transition to a knowledge economy. The people in the north of England who voted for Brexit, uh, the people perhaps in the French countryside, that he's putting, uh, that he's not simply an American phenomenon, perhaps in an internal or a domestic policy way. Okay, thanks. And can you just hand the microphone? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, I've also two fits on each side of the Atlantic. Uh, I have two, two comments, remark, question. One, I think beyond the trade war or so-called trade difficulties between China and the United States, it seems to me that the real issue is more market access. I would say reciprocal market access. What we've seen lately is attempts in the US to block some investments in, by Chinese companies, particularly in certain sensitive sectors. And we have a process called Cyphers that some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. We've seen uh, it's harder for Chinese companies to invest abroad. At the same time, probably the Chinese authorities don't want to spend that much money outside of the country because, as one of the panelists said, the issues are more on the domestic side. So this is one aspect. 
The other thing that I would like, there's been, as Hervé Mariton was pointing out, some, uh, I would say, Trump bashing. And a lot of people don't like Trump for a variety of reasons, which I perfectly understand. I'd like to make two remarks. One, on he's, breath, been elected, okay. he's been elected. I mean, some people said he didn't get uh, he's more. He's been elected. But he's been elected. He's the president. And the second thing is elected by the Americans. Everybody has a view on who should be the president of the United States. But be aware of something, only the American votes. Thank you very much. So let's have one more question, but let's try to have a question about Trump. Um, <laughs> we've, we've wandered around, I think, in a very, in, in a very interesting way. But let's get one last question about Mr. Trump. I see gentleman with his hand up there, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tatsu Masa from Japan. I have a question to former minister, Ms. Mushu Verlin. If you put in the shoes of historian, for example, in 1980, uh, more than 50% of the world's GDP was produced by two countries, China and India. And if history may repeat itself, and if many people predict by 2050, China is by far the largest country in the world in terms of military, economic, political power. Do you think this course of history could be interrupted by something happening between China and the United States now? Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks very, very much. We, we, we don't have tons of time, so let's first try to have quick responses to um, the question about America's image abroad and, and Mr. Trump. Michael, go ahead. Well, but, but, polling, but let's just be brief if we po can. Polling Sorry. data gives us the answer to that. Most Western countries at the moment are distinguishing between their view of the United States and their view of Mr. Trump. And in the Australian case, for example, still seven or eight out of ten Australians believe that the alliance is important to our security, but only 30 per cent of Australians respect Mr. Trump. I worry, though, in the long term, if you think of the, the murder of Mr. Khashoggi, the, the disappearance of the Chinese Interpol chief, for example, these are the kinds of questions that in the past we would have relied on, expected the United States, the President of the United States to take a lead on. Now that doesn't happen. What does it mean that someone like Erdogan of Turkey is a greater advocate of press freedom and of getting to the truth of Mr. Khashoggi's uh, uh, murder than the President of the United States. And the final thing I'd say is, what if Mr. Trump is re-elected? It's one thing for us to suspend disbelief when America elects him once, but what if he's re-elected? Uh, Roz, do you have a, a thought on this? Or am I putting you in a spot? Uh, on the image abroad, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I'm in a great position okay. to, to describe that. I can talk a little bit about his image in the US, but. <laughs> <laughs> Which we'll hear a lot about mid Mid-November, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, would anyone else like to? Igor, what's what does Trump look like? Hello. Sorry. We have inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis Americans, but we have a superiority complex either. So this is a dissonance <laughs> cognitive, total. So uh, the, the rich people of, in, in Russia would, would run to the United States, buy properties and, and enjoy life, but coming back they would bash Trump, Americans and all of that stuff. So it's very situational. And then for example on the 11th of November in Paris, uh, by some mir uh, miracle Putin strikes a deal with Trump, then uh, six, month, six days later the public opinion of Russia being brainwashed by television would say that 60% of the Russian population is strongly for Trump. Yes, uh, I'm afraid both our populations are a little bit the same way. Mr. Wang. Uh, I, I think Trump, it's difficult to separate Trump from the United States. In the sense, in, in China, for instance, uh, Trump is trying, uh, his administration is trying to uh, uh, drive some Chinese presence, uh, presence from the United States. Chinese students, Chinese businesses, so that hurts the United States image in China. 
basically, the United States still enjoys a, a, a lot of uh, popularity, uh, especially among the Chinese younger intellectuals and students. But if they are denied access to U.S. universities, they will have to go somewhere else, Australia, <laughs> Great Britain, and, and other countries. So it depends on whether that kind of policy will continue. Yes, thank you. Um, Ichiro, I think you're probably going to have the last word. So uh, go ahead. Just uh, one word. Uh, because uh, Japan's relations uh, with the United States has been so close and so strong up till now, uh, we were able to uh, distinguish the two, Trump and the United States. I hope this will last long. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, listen, we are out of time. I apologize to those who wanted to ask questions, and, and I failed to let you do that. So my apologies, but my thanks to this panel for a really interesting discussion. All the best. Thank you.